Okay, I think we are ready to start. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the EGPP seminar series. Uh, for those who join us for the first time, my name is Daniele Karaman, and I will be chairing this uh, session. The EGPP seminar series combines various types of seminars, research seminars, conversations, and other types, and today's session is a book presentation. We are very fortunate to have two uh, authors of an important work, professors John Eric Fossum of ARENA Center for European Studies at the University of Oslo, and uh, Joseph Batora of Comelius University to present their work uh, toward a segmented European political order, the European Union's post-crisis conundrum, a book published by Routledge earlier this year and to engage in a debate on their findings and core argument. The book is receiving a lot of attention and we are delighted to be able to debate its content with both of you. Due to COVID restrictions, we hold this session online only. I'm sure that it will be an engaging and stimulating seminar nonetheless, and I very much look forward to it. Thank you very much to both John Eric and Joseph for accepting our invitation being with us and taking the time to present your work. In terms of format, both authors will give an initial presentation of about 30, max 40 minutes, and then both authors will take questions and comments. To those attending, please keep your microphones muted, but the video switched on if possible. During Q&A, you can use the hand function if you want to make a comment or uh, ask a question, obviously you can also just write in the, in the chat, um, but probably it's best to use the hand function because then I have uh, a, an overview of everyone who wants to intervene. Thank you all for being with us today and especially to our two speakers. Um, the floor is yours, John Eric and Joseph, whenever you are ready to share your screen and to start your presentation. All right, well, uh, thank you very much, Daniela, and it's a great pleasure to, uh, to be here. Of course, it would have been wonderful to have actually taken the trip uh, to uh, Firenze once again, um, but given the conditions, we have to uh, meet in this way. Um, now, uh, yeah, we do have, uh, as, as Daniela has indicated, a presentation where we will uh, uh, go on CNN style, so uh, I will start, but maybe John Eric, you wanna say a few words uh, before we start? Well, I'm, I just want to echo uh, Josef that we are very happy to um, be with you. And of course, it would have been much nicer to be in Florence, as you can see from Daniela's uh, uh, background. <laughs> uh, a marvelous place and uh, a major intellectual stimulus that uh, I certainly have benefited a lot from over the years. Uh, so uh, I'm very happy to, to be able to engage with you in this. and. Um, and we look forward also to your feedback on, on something that we are working on. So thank you. Please go ahead, Josef. Thank you. Um, so let me try and uh, share, the, share the screen with you. I um, hope you can see that now. Um, can you all see the screen? I, I hope you can. Okay, so um, this is a, uh, a book project. It's a book that we have uh, done together with uh, John Eric and a group of colleagues. Uh, we have been working on this, um, well, for two years or so um, before it was published earlier this year. Um, now, uh, it is called Towards a Segmented European Political Order. As uh, John Eric has pointed out, uh, we, are, we continue to work on this, so uh, it will be very valuable feedback from you on the ideas that we will be presenting here, because we do continue developing the concept of a segmented political order, but we can talk about that, of course, in the Q&A. Um, here is the, uh, the cover of the, of the book, uh, gives you a visual idea as to what this is. Um, and um, I can also give you um, a list of, uh, of chapters uh, that are in there. It's an edited volume um, that was the result of a research uh, project we've been working on. Um, so here you see the kinds of topics that are addressed um, uh, by the book. Basically, it was building on, uh, on the crises that have been going on in Europe since about 2010. 
and we have been trying to conceptualize the European Union's response to those crises. Uh, what kind of a structural mutations has the European Union gone through and what does that really mean for the development of the European Union as a political project, but also as an institutional project and as a, as, as a set of, uh, as a policy and poli as a policy making uh, system. So uh, here is a, a, you know here is the continued list of, of the chapters, and I'm sure we can also uh, you can also find that uh, when you when you look at it. So basically, the 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 book builds on a paradox. Um, uh, we have you know or our our interest or the puzzle that we were looking at was a sort of a paradoxical situation. Um, because of the EU's, uh, because of the crises that the European Union has gone through, and we're talking about, of course, the financial crisis, the Eurozone crisis, the migration crisis, but also the geopolitical crisis related to, um, you know, Russia's uh, assertiveness in Eastern Europe, uh, as well as the falling apart of, uh, of states in the southern neighborhood of the southern southeastern neighborhood of the European Union. Uh, the European Union has become much more a, of a differentiated place. So the pressures towards differentiation have been growing uh, in Europe, and we have seen various types of differentiation uh, going on, be that you know, in terms of policy diversity, but also a growing structural pluralism in the European Union. Uh, and that includes, of course, um, values and worldviews and the kinds of debates we have just seen uh, in the budget debate with Poland and Hungary increasingly uh, blo blocking the uh, EU budget uh, is only further evidence of that rift that has been emerging with some member states uh, in the area of values and worldviews. Now, um, the interesting aspect that we thought was uh, was quite puzzling and quite uh, that that increasingly um, drew us to the topic uh, was, in fact, uh, uh, the responses that the European Union has brought forward, because, of course. Uh, there has been all kinds of differentiation that going on, but at the same time, the European Union has managed to bring about various kinds of policy responses, some of which were very effective. Uh, those, however, also were informed by particular sets of cognitive closures and particular sets of solutions that were introduced in the, uh, in the process of managing the crisis. And so, um, so an example of this would be the management of the Eurozone crisis in which you know, austerity measures and ordo liberalism was increasingly, increasingly the ideational foundation um, that has then uh, become dominant. And uh, that of course had led to organizing in certain solutions uh, for the crisis and then organizing out others. Um, so we thought, okay, differentiation as such, as a concept and as a theoretical approach in thinking about the European Union, that is uh, interesting, but it's not enough in, in allowing us to actually understand what really is going on in Europe, and we need to understand uh, more deeply what this is. Um, so we come up with the idea of segmentation uh, as a way of conceptualizing what exactly is happening uh, and how do we then get an analytical grip on these policy responses uh, to the crisis? Uh, we build on some older literature on segmentation that goes back to the 1970s and, and the Norwegian political science, and in particular, you know, Tom Christensen and Morten Egeberg, but also Johan Olsen and a number of other people have been working on this idea of a segment. And in the context of, of Norway, of policymaking in Norway, segment would be defined as a stable pattern of linking participants who share common conceptions of problems, solutions, and choice opportunities in policymaking. Now, those of you who know the garbage can model of organizational choice by uh, March and Olsen will, of course, recognize the dimensions of the garbage can. So here is a patterned type of um, uh, type of a constellation of actors, solutions, and choice opportunities stabilizing in a segment. Um, now, what we see uh, in the EU, we apply that notion to the context of the EU, and we see the emergence and we conceptualize uh, the policy responses as stabilized constellations and patterns of interaction between governmental agencies, NGOs, private enterprises, political activists, and think tanks, and of course, EU institutions emerging and then uh, in, in recurring patterns 
stabilizing these responses and again organizing in certain solutions and organizing out others now in u.s political context this would be very much connected to the notion of iron triangles that Allison and zelikov have been conceptualizing where of course they've been looking at and some some of some of them have been looking at uh, how the u.s administration is working in in promoting policies for instance the department of defense working together with uh, uh, congressional committees as well as interest groups in promoting certain sets of policy solutions however compared to these uh, older ideas uh, we find that uh, segmentation in the eu is less instrumental and could be much more random uh, and emerging and growing out of uh, policy responses uh, to um, to uh, various kinds of uh, kinds of crises, um, and not exactly the result of a of a conscious design. John Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yosef. Uh, could you move on to the next slide? I I, I think I have. Yes, yes. you have. Sorry. Um, oh, go one back. Yeah, there we are. Great. Now, <laughs> this is CNN, but we're a little bit on speed. Um, so what we did uh, in order to, uh, in, when putting the book together was, as you also said, we initially were thinking about the, the different types of, um, of um, crises that the EU, uh, and to get a handle on how the EU responded to the crises. But, but uh, as we went through, we also had this idea of uh, segmentation, segment, uh, in, a, in the back of our minds. And we basically have developed these categories fairly inductively. So I think we had this intuition about segments, but then looking at all the different contributions and so on, and when we discussed this, it, we tried to develop these types of criteria. So in that sense, this is a work in progress, as Josef also said. Um, so we have, to some extent, drawing on understandings of political order and segments and then looking at this in relation to the EU we've come up with a set of criteria that we think are, are relevant for this however what should be un underlined is that some of these would be very close to and, and kind of constitutive of the understanding of of segments other ones would be more um, contextual and, and, and therefore conditional on various other factors. But what is important is that we took the notion of segment, which is located at the meso level and lifted this to the macro level, to the political order level. Basically that's the, the leap we have made in, in doing so. And so, so we are talking about the macro political aspects of a system. And that's the radical thing about this because you have segments as Joseph was saying, it's, it's talked about segments in all kinds of areas and across disciplines. But what we took was a bold move to say, look, there are political entities that can be understood as segmented political orders. And of course, this resonates with uh, history, which, which Charles Tilly, of course, how, uh, and others have been talking about in pre-modern systems, that political systems were segmented because they were not based on territorial functional contiguity, the correspondence between territory function and hierarchy, but they were more diverse in terms of the relationship between territory and, and functionality. And therefore, in relation to a normal state, they were partial in certain senses. So that's the, the type of move we have taken in order to try to depict and understand um, th this concept and apply it to the European Union. So we take from the normal I idea of segment, as Josef was saying, ideas and ideologies that limit the search for alternatives and foster closure. And of course, we're trying to define and identify some of these in the EU. So one example could be neoliberal austerity policy, having turned from from order liberal towards, I'm not sure, sure if we can say neoliberal, but anyway, and then also to see how this is embedded in policy instruments and, and the notion of a policy style, a distinct policy style. And again, this is not a defining feature of a segment as such, but under certain circumstances, a, a system that is segmented, biased with and partial and so forth, will have a certain repertoire of policy instruments because of its biases and therefore it will lean in certain types of directions similarly since we're talking about the macroscopic area 
insofar as there are mind frames, ideas and ideologies, actor specific characteristics that are then embedded and become aspects of the structure, then you have to have institutional systems that lock in these. So then cement certain ways of framing issues and understanding issues and so on. And therefore also systematically organize out alternatives. So you see in, in the notion of of a segmented order, we are talking about actor-specific characteristics as well as structure-specific characteristics. But we're also talking about context, and that's the next slide. And of course, one element with the EU, for instance, uh, which we will get back to, is the fact that it is embedded in member states, and they have also constrained the EU's the EU levels uh, access to resources and capabilities, and also material as well as immaterial. And there's also the external dependence and vulnerability in a partial system, in a, system, in a world of states. In, in a partial system with limited resources, it is obviously vulnerable. And the last feature is that it's biased also in institutional terms it, in that it has weaker desegmenting elements and arrangements than segmenting ones. And this shows that we're talking about political systems and so forth as marked by dynamics of segmentation and desegmentation. So this can be a continuum rather than a, a, um, a dichotomous notion. So some systems are more. So that's also compatible with the idea that you can lift up, up the notion of segment from a meso level to a systemic feature, to the macroscopic uh, element. So, so, so therefore, the dynamics here come in. And that, that also suggests that systems can move in both directions. And it also suggests that states can become segmented. So you can have organizations, a few um, elements of states coming together to form a segmented union, but you can also have a state becoming segmented, even in a macroscopic sense. So if you go into looking at poorly functioning states, well, maybe some of these actually qualify as segmented political orders. Okay, next slide. So it is also important to think that the segment emanates from the notion of network. But of course, when we think about this in terms of a segmented order, then this is entrenched in institutions. And it typically cuts across institutions and levels, including various types of institutional arrangements. As you saw from the initial definition that Joseph gave of segment, it ties across different types of institutions and systems. So it's, it can have a flexibility, but the idea of a segmented order means that this is somehow more entrenched. So the idea again, certain actor constellations, like-minded people, and it can be one or several. That, that's also something that can vary depending on the scope of the system. Next slide. So this is what I mentioned earlier, the affinity to the pre-modern because of the lack of functional territorial contiguity. And of course, we can also easily then think that it would be imbued with pathologies. We talked about cognitive bias. Um, we talked about distinctive forms of opening and closure uh, to solutions and problems. We also think about different learning and decision pathologies, and we'll get back to this. Of course, a system that is segmented like this, especially if it has several segments, will have problems of coordinating across segments. And since it is lopsided, there can easily be legitimacy uh, problems and fallouts pertaining to exclusion and alienation. Next slide, please. So then we, having identified these features, what we do then is in, in the various contributions to the book, we try to spell out more in more specific terms how these six features or, or traits def, uh, are actually manifesting themselves in the EU. And and we start with the actor specific uh, aspects and talk about two elements that we think um, one is the internal market rationality that you find, especially in the internal market. And the other one is the securitization in the border and controls and uh, in relation to asylum and refugee policy and, and so forth. And we, we, we're, dis we're discussing, and I think we're still discussing the question of the relationship between an institutional logic and a more specific actor orientation. In the book, we un underlined the austerity policy and talked about this as a particular form of segmental closure. But it might also be that 
institutional logics in more broad sense, like a marketization that that Bartle and other people are talking about, Schaff also probably, um, could in itself be a source of segmentation, certainly conditioned towards certain action orientations that crowd out other ways of thinking about issues. Securitization is is taken from the Copenhagen School um, uh, about how how issues are being defined as security concerns, basically. Uh, and we believe that the relation, if you looked at uh, the um, the uh, uh, refugee crisis, that it started out as a humanitarian crisis and was framed in those terms, and then it quite quickly turned into much more of a securitization problem. And insofar as this is a self-reinforcing logic across all those dealing with it, then this becomes a much more cemented type of mind frame. And, and the idea is that these two active specific elements are being reinforced by the subsequent elements that we will be running through in the next slide, please. And that has to do with, for instance, the policy style, which is lopsided, the regulatory state of the EU and so on. Um, and, um, and also the mobilization and activation of expertise in, in the comatology. These are also positive elements, by the way, but they can be mobilized in certain ways. But there are certain built-in biases in the EU's policy style. And we'll say more about this in the next slide. Namely, the, the, the institutional embedding. And here you, you have two tracks in the EU, of course. It started out much more with the community system, which is uh, the internal market, but also the Eurozone. And that's flanked with what has happened and been developed by the European Council in the uh, intergovernmental system or the union system, which is often called. And what this means is that the, the horizontal functional division between the two systems combined with the vertical element of fusion or lock-in in the particular style that Genschel and Jakten folks especially have been talking about in, in their important work on, on core state powers, shows how you can get a, a, a kind of lock-in of, the, of these types of, uh, of um, segmental logics in, this, in the EU. So the fusion means that member states are imbricated in the EU institutions and they implement the actions by the EU. And therefore, um, they are locked into. So they, it's a self, they, they want to control EU institutions and having and wanting to do so, they lock themselves into the EU institutions. And when integration proceeds, that means that they are subsequently more and more locked into that type of system. So that's, and this is in the uh, internal market. So therefore the marketization dynamic is driven in this particular uh, constellation. And then you have the intergovernmental system or the union system. Here you also have fiscal policy, by the way, that is supposed to be be in sync with monetary policy, which of course in this is in the first system. So that's this is what Schaff is talking about, the imbalance both in decision procedures and in the division between the two. So that's that's also helping to entrench the kind of marketization logic under the community system. And in the intergovernmental system, that is also in our view helping to entrench this securitization logic also partly because of the way in which decisions are being made in, in that system. Next slide, please. So this is what I was saying about the combination of horizontal functional separation between the two systems and the vertical one. So we are fusing to some extent the insights from Schaff and Wessels in this. So Schaff is talking about the horizontal uh, functional separation and Vessels is talking about the idea of fusion of levels of governing. So together, this is generating a type of institutional lock-in. Um, and I, I would think also, again, as I said, the fact that member states do not actually uh, confer sovereignty on the EU institutions and resources on the EU institutions, but rather the EU institutions themselves avail themselves of member state capacity means, of course, also that the EU is more dependent on the member states in carrying this out and therefore is also being limited in the capacities in, in the independence it has to carry out there. So this interweaving of EU institutions and member states is important, but it is a very distinct form of interweaving that, that is, is helping to um, 
embed these types of, of, of logics. Next slide. And this cannot be understood without also due attention being paid to the constraints. The EU was initially constrained, of course, and depends still on member states financing. Um, so this is again what, what I took from again Shilan Jakob the, um, the paradox of the capacity that the EU has actually action capacity, but it depends to a lot on actually the cooperation of the member states in doing so. So the EU has circumvented constraints over time by integrating, however, in a very distinctive way. And this is exactly what is being underlined, not by separating the EU level institutions from the member states, by, but instead of this type of fusion of systems. And the last point is also, I think, important in the sense that since the EU is an experimental union, it has limited recourse to the type of what you could call a legitimacy buffer that familiar types of polity can more readily draw on. The nation state has a vocabulary and, and a normative association with democratic legitimacy that the EU is struggling to get. So this is not only in terms of the EU's performance, but it's also in terms of what people associate with legitimate policy orders. So the EU has a harder time to try to justify itself. It can do so and has been shown resilience. So we have had a discussion with Adrien Heritier on this that was very useful and underlined this. Yes, of course, it can build up a resilience and a form of output legitimacy, but it's more difficult for the EU because it is an experimental system to compete on the legitimacy templates because these are normative templates that are very um, strongly embedded in people's uh, mindsets. Next slide. And again, the external uh, vulnerability we saw in the Eurozone crisis, the lack of own resources and the unwillingness to commit and to give to make give a, a EU based backstop and so on made the EU much more dependent on on the financial market. Similarly, of course, also in the refugee crisis, uh, and not the least the EU Turkey agreement in this sense uh, was also a significant limitation. And I should also add um, that internal strife and, and contestation and the rise of right-wing populism is also a significant constraint on EU action that is adding to, that can be said to be cementing, solidifying this because it doesn't allow the EU to unleash a lot of capacity. We have seen now, of course, the corona might change this. It's going to be really interesting to see with the rescue fund and so on, if this solidifies to, to make to give the EU a, a significant uh, fiscal uh, lever. In that case, we would call this a desegmenting element. So the element so far from the corona suggests that there's a certain type of desegmenting process going on. But the question is, is this going to be a permanent feature? Is this going to be entrenched in the institutions? Or will it still fall into this kind of pattern that we are seeing? Next slide. And of course, with the crisis, uh, the, the segmentation bias built in is the institutional discrepancy between those institutions that you can see fostering segmentation versus those that are unsegmenting. And we associate that with institutions that open up segments, uh, bring in different accounts and different logics and parliaments, transparency arrangements and other forms that activate and bring in different views and opinions and challenge established orthodoxies are typically desegmenting. And of course, as you see in dem democracies, they have a balance. And segments are, are not necessarily destructive because they can also facilitate action. And Josef will talk more about this in, in the next second. Okay, back to you, Josef. All right, thank you, uh, John Eric. Uh, Indeed, uh, and so um, the, um, the there are two different kinds of uh, different kinds of logics that we could associate when we're thinking about uh, the emergent uh, emergent organization, a political organization in Europe. And one is the logic of differentiation, and the other one is, of course, the logic of uh, segmentation. Um, now, differentiation more generally could be associated with the notion of exploration. Um, and, and the, here we're, of course, talking about exploration and exploitation in the Jim March's sense. Uh, 
So uh, we're talking about the, the rise of new kinds of structures um, and, uh, and uh, the inventiveness, inventing new types of new ways of uh, organizing politics. On the other hand, segmentation more broadly is about exploitation of existing knowledge, of existing expertise, existing solutions within a given constellation of actors. Uh, so segmentation more generally is more, you know, is prone to competency traps and various kinds of learner lock-ins. So uh, you basically uh, know the concept of failing forward. Uh, so you exploit established ideas that, uh, that you have tried out before, uh, and those are then applied to and, and then activate resources for solutions, for policy solutions. Um, so what we have seen emerging uh, in Europe is uh, that there are that, that the EU, in response to the various crises, um, and be that the uh, the uh, eurozone crisis, the migration crisis, um, or other crises that we have seen in recent years, has gone through uh, various types of structural mutation uh, in reaction to the crises. Um, and that in particular, because the EU as such was simply incapable to act uh, on in, in very dire constraint, very dire situations. And, and there were various kinds of constraints on actorness. Um, and so in those situations, one was setting up various kinds of alternative structures uh, that would enable the EU to act together. And uh, you could say that there are a number of structures emerging uh, in the EU supporting various kinds of segmental logics. Arguably, um, the, you know, the European External Action Service uh, would be one. The European Stability Mechanism is another one. The European Border and Coast Guards, uh, Border and Coast Guard would be another one. And you could, of course, name a number of other examples. Now, what exactly are these? If you look at these uh, these examples, well, are those agencies? And some of the literature on agencyfication has been looking at you know development of the EU's governance system along the lines of um, you know looking at and conceptualizing uh, various types of agencies, um, as if this were a process of agencyfication. Now, are any of these agencies? Well, not really. Um, they're uh, they're not agencies of the traditional kind, right? So if you look at the European External Action Service, um, that's a you know legally from the Lisbon Treaty, it's a body, an independent body of the Union, uh, which is basically equidistant to the Commission and to the Council. It's certainly not an agency uh, in the traditional sense. The European tradition stability mechanism, and I will talk about that more specifically uh, in a moment. Uh, is also not an agency, it's an international organization set up outside of the treaties uh, to help the Eurozone forge um, bailout packages. Now the European Border and Coast Guard, that it does contain an agency and that's Frontex, but in fact, it's much more than just Frontex. The, it, it is a, well, some would characterize it as a legal construct connecting resources of member states, Border and Coast Guard agencies with the EU's Border and Coast Guard agency that is Frontex. And so this is again a construct which is uh, which is something different than just a traditional agency. So how do we conceptualize the that conceptualize these new types of structures? Now some literature uh, has suggested that uh, they could be conceptualized as de novo institutions. Uwe Putter and colleagues uh, have suggested that. Now um, are we happy with such a conceptualization? And I think it's good that they have done so. But I mean, are we happy with that? Well, what does that really tell us that they're new institutions? Well, not much. So I think we should we challenged ourselves to go further and uh, and think about um, uh, a concept that would help us understand what they are. And we suggest that they could be conceptualized as interstitial organizations. That is, an interstice is a location between two institutional domains, um, and this comes as a concept from. Um, uh, from organizational sociology. Uh, and we define interstitial organizations as an organization emerging in the interstices between various organizational fields and recombining physical, informational, financial, legal, and legitimacy resources stemming from organizations belonging to these different organizational fields. Now, I'm very sure that you're familiar with the work of Adrienne Eritier and her colleagues on interstitial change in uh, European Union governance. Um, now, our concept is a little different from that work, which we very much appreciate, um, where, of course, uh, Adrienne Eritier has been looking at, um, at how informal rules, 
are exploited and used um, in complementarity to formal rules. Um, and so, and there are various kinds of openings and opportunities being used by actors and thereby change can be brought about. Now in our, uh, in our case, we're looking at structural mutations, organizational mutations and organizational structures supporting segments and supporting segmental cooperation, segmented cooperation. Here is a model of what an uh, interstitial organization between fields could look like. So, uh, you know, here's in institutional field A uh, with its norms, rules, practices, and resources. Institutional field B with its norms, rules, practices, and resources, and institutional field C. And in between those, you would have the interstitial organization tapping into the various resources of these fields, recombining rules and norms, and, and new sets of alternative practice frames emerging. Now that of course are concepts that are very close to the work or build on the work of um, organizational sociologists such as Walter Powell or John Paget, um, um, as well as um, uh, Calvin Morrill um, at Berkeley. So th they, they've been looking at various kinds of innovation, organizational innovation and the formation of new organizational forms via recombination and transposition of rules and norms. And that's what we think is happening with some of these new structures emerging in EU governance. I mentioned the European External Action Service. Now, of course, it is an organization emerging between the institutional domains of diplomacy, defense, intelligence, development aid, and various kinds of resources are being recombined and a new organizational form is formed. So when, what exactly are the scope conditions for setting up interstitial organizations? Now, uh, that would include an institutional performance crisis. So in general, an established set of institutions are simply incapable to provide resources, rules, and actor capacity to perform uh, on a particular function that needs to be performed uh, in a crisis. Now, um, in uh, the next, uh, condition would be, you know, there would be structural, there would be political as well as as well as political uh, constraints on the actorness, legal constraints as well. So, uh, so that would be another scope condition. And then, of course, there would be a functional need to perform a particular policy. The examples, as I said, include the ESM, the EBCG, and the EAS. Uh, now, we have no time to go uh, in depth on all three. I will just go into depth a little bit more on, I will say a little bit more about the ESM. In the book, uh, the other two are also uh, explored uh, in more detail. So what exactly is the European stability mechanism? Well, as you know, it's a, uh, it was the established during the sovereign debt crisis in Greece, Portugal and Ireland between 2009 and 2011. Now, the established league rules of the European Monetary Union at the time did not provide support for any measures that would help in addressing the crisis. So, um, no bailouts would not be possible, no mutual guarantees, no expelling, and so on. So, um, the rules did not support action that could provide for, you know, basically helping and saving Greece in their, in, in their situation, as well as the other countries, Portugal and Ireland. So um, what was then set up was a, uh, in a kind of a crisis mode. And of course, as you remember, the euro was about to collapse um, in that. And there were very, some very tense months at the time. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, there was a permanent crisis resolution mechanism set up in the form of an intergovernmental organization under international law with seat in Luxembourg, but it is outside the treaties uh, of the European Union, um, comprised first 17, now 19 countries of the Eurozone, um, and it was inaugurated in October 8, 2012 um, um, by the Eurozone member state governments uh, in the treaty. Now, there are three uh, levels uh, of governance uh, in the organization, in the ESM. There's the Board of Governors. Um, they're usually the finance ministers of the Eurozone member states. There's the Board of Directors. Um, those are usually the state secretaries from the economy ministries. And then the executive director uh, is uh, in charge of the organization, Klaus Regling. Now, um, and by the way, in terms of his dem in terms of demography, but this is of course uh, someone with experience, direct experience from the IMF, but also from the G German banking sector. Um, so, uh, in terms of how they actually make decisions on the bailout packages, well, there are vote there are votes between the members, 
um, but that depends on the level of investments, right? So Germany in this case is 26.98% of the vote. Um, France uh, has 20.23%, Austria 2.76, Slovakia 0 0.81, Luxembourg 0 0.24. So in fact, if Germany and France agree on a policy, uh, it's difficult to counter that, right? Of course, they wouldn't have more than 50%, but still, uh, there it's that's very close. Um, and so, to mount an opposition against France and Germany in this um, in here is is very difficult. Um, the staff in 2019 had uh, 155 employees from 35 countries. So it's not only eurozone member states, but also there are, you know, experts from the U.S., from China, and from Brazil. Um, there are no EU employees, so they pay no taxes uh, as well. Um, the ESM has been working. It's, um, they've really provided some serious uh, support to um, the crisis management. Um, and so Greece has exited the ESM program successfully um, in, uh, in 2018. Arguably, and this is from the, uh, from the ESM itself, from its self-assessment in its annual report, uh, they, they argued that the Greece has saved 13 billion euros in its uh, 2018 budget alone compared to market financing. So more, it's around 7% of the Greek GDP um, because they have, used, uh, they have used the ESM bailout programs. So what happens with the, you know, there, there are some serious challenges with accountability here. Of course it works, it's functional. Um, it supports the segment of, uh, or the ordo liberal segment in EU governance, in Eurozone governance. But at the same time, there are some very serious challenges to democratic accountability. Um, so there are some unclear and overlapping responsibilities uh, in, in how the ESM actually operates. So it has programs in, in, you know, the programs in Greece, they were negotiated by, by the commission in cooperation with the European Central Bank. Then it's approved by the ESM Board of Governors, uh, which consists of Eurozone finance uh, ministers, uh, which is all fine. Uh, but again, there are uh, issues about you know, access to information by, for instance, or, or in fact, to, to actual influence by, for instance, governments in Denmark, in Sweden, uh, that is the non-Eurozone uh, member states. Um, the usual forms of EU level accountability are not exactly applicable because they're outside the treaties. So this is not, you know, the, the, the standard types of uh, administrative accountability in Bowen's sense that would not exactly apply here. Um, the ESM director does attend hearings in European Parliament, but that's all. I mean, they don't have to. They're not responsible in, you know, uh, in being accountable to the EP. Um, there have been some attempts uh, to bring the ESM under commission control that has failed. Um, and in particular, the German government actually have actually been against that. Um, you know, a lot of the decision making in, in terms of the bailout packages simply is, you know, happening behind closed doors. Um, and as I said, you know, some countries who are not Eurozone member states, they're not allowed in and they, you know, they could, you know, have observer status in some of the discussions, but not necessarily have any kind of an influence. Um, for a program to pass, you need 85% uh, support uh, for, uh, for that. So uh, small member states don't necessarily have any kind of a leverage. Um, there are three member states who do have a veto, in fact, in the decisions given this rule. So it's in particular Germany, France, and Italy. Um, ESM non-members are merely observers. And indeed, um, the, there is a memorandum of understanding been between the ESM and the European Commission that's signed in 2018. Um, and uh, they're basically formalizing their relationship um, as one based on collaboration and sharing expertise and experience, which in fact, uh, for the time being, but also in the medium period, actually formalizes the status of the ESM as something which will remain outside uh, the remit of the EU's institutions. Um, for some conclusions, um, I think I'll uh, give the floor back to Yonetic. Um, uh, Yonetic, the floor is yours. Okay, CNN. <laughs> yeah, actually, um... Just to sum up of some of the observations, um, we are, as you could see from uh, Joseph's presentation, we are trying to straddle the line between the macroscopic aspects and then also rather specific features. And um, that has its own complications um, to communicate exactly how things fit in. We do believe that that these types, these different types, both the sort of 
more established institutions that you have in the EU, but also the more experimental aspects that are developing in the interstitial ways can help to sustain uh, segments. Exactly how or the causal link or the development here is something that is complicated and we have not made up, we have not clarified exactly how that works. So this is something that we are working on because we also need to to uh, hone in properly on exactly what we mean both by segmentation and also by segmented political order. So that is part of the work in progress aspect. Um, but we do start with, of course, the, the general understanding of, of these orders as being partial incomplete, especially when you look at them in relation to nation states. Um, and therefore the resonance, I mean, you have had these debates on, on neo-medievalism in Europe and so on, and I think there's a certain resonance, but of course we are talking about a world of states and our expectations are shaped by the state system and the world of states. So that's also why we would call them partial incomplete and so on. Um, so precisely because of the isomorphic pressure from states, we also associate them with pathological features associated with built-in biases. But we could also take a step back and think about the EU, its origins as a peacemaking mechanism. That also, of course, was a segment. It was not imbued with all the different types. And as Millwall and others have been pointing out, was established in order to save problems or help the state system. Um, but if, if this develops, and it's also then uh, giving a greatest um, well, it's more integrated and also has greater leverage and impact on, on, the, on the constituent elements, then the dynamics also change and then other people's, people's expectations change. And then elements that were important at a certain point in time could also become pathological over time. And especially, well, because I would argue that the EU was desegmenting as it developed because it was developing the democratic machinery and these types of legitimacy expectations. But with the crisis, we saw a kind of reversal. So it was moving towards a segmented system again. And that's why we also point to the pathological elements. And yet, as you see with the EU, it can be quite resilient. And they can also um, generate action capability under different circumstances, including, as Joseph was saying, in interstitial spaces, in places that are generally crowding out the scope for action and yet there's this potential for doing so and that has to do with a certain type of a dynamic in the relationship between exploitation and exploration that you was talking about so i think the gist of this is that we need to understand the dynamic interaction of segmentation and desegmentation in a changing world not only at the meso level that is normal discussion of, of these features in states, but also the fact that this can take on microscopic features and become constitutive elements of the political system. Thank you. Thank you very much, John Eric. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Joseph, for your stimulating and uh, indeed challenging conceptualization of European uh, governance. Um, very challenging, very uh, interesting way of looking at an emerging po new political uh, political order. Um, we'll open the floor now, noticing that there are uh, several of the um, scholars you mentioned in your presentation, like Philip Genchel, Adekinopie, Bridget Lapa. Uh, this should uh, uh, speak for the quality of these seminars, not only. Uh, in the speakers, but also in the in the in the audience, um, please use the uh, hand function if you would like to ask a question, to make a comment. I don't see anyone for the moment. I don't know if this is. A technical problem or if indeed people are still thinking about their remarks somehow i can't raise my hand oh adrienne and anya want to come in yes now i see two hands uh, so uh, um oh no let me see if i have something in the chat as well 
Okay, very good. So we can start with, um, give me a second. Um, so we can start with Adrienne, then Anya, and then Philippe, if that's okay. Uh, Adrienne, please. Yes, thank you very much, Yoneli. Thank you very much, Joseph. Um, yes, we did uh, discuss that uh, before. And now it was really interesting, again, re-listening to you. And uh, the question in a way which emerged to me is if you would have to say to somebody who doesn't know anything about the European Union and the structure of his politics, how would you then kind of very briefly summarize the overall structure of the European policy, including these segmented orders and the interstitial organizations, but also taking into account, you know, the traditional pillars and processes? John Eric and uh, Joseph, if you would like to react immediately. You want, you want to go first, John Eric, or should I go first? Hi, I was trying to unmute. <laughs> yes, this. Um, yes, this is uh, what we <laughs> are trying to do. Um, I think I would start by by precisely underlining them the fact that the European Union is incomplete and yet more than an international organization. It is, uh, th that would be the first in terms of understanding the, the EU, that's to say, look, it has elements of, of stateness, but it certainly is not a state. So that's the first. And at the same time, it is clearly more and different from an international organization. So that would be the first, first point. And then to say that there are certain logics that permeate the European Union more prominently than other ones, and that they crowd out other logics. I think, um, and, and that has to do with some of the built-in constraints on the European Union. Um, so that, for instance, it is much more developed within the market making than in the market correcting element. Now, one thing that we have not discussed in a book that we also should be doing is is the the environmental aspect that the fact is that the European Union also is a significant environmental forerunner in the world. So that's something that we need to fit into our scheme. Um, and it could also mean that a system that is based on regulation can actually push an environmental agenda, which would would show that it's not merely about pathological elements. But we think that the the integration through law through and using economics as a political uh, device in order to foster cooperation and to bind states together has developed this type of partial polity. And that it is therefore susceptible to um, certain types of logics more than other ones in the way it is structurally configured. So that there will be a certain type of built-in bias in the way the EU is configured. This has merits in a decisional sense. It also has limitations. And when this becomes more entrenched and these segments are becoming more uh, embedded and, and there is a lock-in, then this has clear uh, legitimacy and democratic problems of the lack of, of proper accountability. I think I'll, I'll start with that and then we'll, we'll push on. So we're trying to say something about the distinctiveness of the EU without saying necessarily saying that it is... Um, totally unique because we're also drawing on a vocabulary that is associated with political systems, but not confined to the modern state system. Josef, would you like to add something briefly? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I, I think that I'm just to just, to, you know, I, I totally agree with everything that John Eric said. And, and now the, I think what is in, what is in an aspect that's important to, to bear in mind, how do you, that the, the EU actually has some bridges and platforms between the two. I mean, Adrienne, you asked about, uh, and of course we discussed this, and we asked about how do you complement the existing understanding of the EU? I would say these are, you know, the, the pipes and prisms of the EU between the existing institutions that allow the EU to actually operate as a political order uh, and bring about solutions in its imperfect state. 
if it were a state, uh, then of course we would just, you know, the EU would simply copy solutions from a state, uh, from a federal, you know, type of state. And this would be a development that would be, you know, boring and dangerous at the same time, of course, because um, boring in the sense co of copying and just, a per, you know, a perpetuation of an existing model. And then uh, dangerous because we know what happens when big states emerge, right? From history, we know, we know exactly what happens. So this imperfect state is actually very good for the EU because it's it's more <laughs> the ambiguity is more peaceful. Um, but that's just a kind of a general reflection. But indeed, there are platforms uh, between uh, existing institutions that allow for actorness in an imperfect state. Thank you. Uh, Anya is next. Yeah, thank you very much. This is really interesting. I mean, the 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 leap from from uh, concepts on the meso level to to the macro level. I, I have two questions uh, on on definitions. The first is how do you define political order, and what is interesting for you in the political order, and and how do uh, let's say the ideas and norms you've talked a lot about. Um, how do they relate to the, to the actors? So in, in your concept of, of political order. And then my second question, which relates to this is, and which relates perhaps to also something that Adrienne has asked before, is you've talked twice about patho pathologies of the political order, which is a hugely normatively laden term. So that means for me, you have a sort of ideal type. I mean, you've perhaps alluded to it at the end because you've said, well, the European Union has desegmented and now it's again segmenting. So what is the ideal type then behind if you talk about patho pathologies of a system? Um, yeah, thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll start. Um, yeah, political order is of course at the macro, the constitutive principles and organizations that sustain a system of orderly rule and governing. It would be the sort of shorthand definition of political order. So it would be a macroscopic. It would also have a normative aspect in, in, sen in the sense that it is about constitutive. So on the one hand, it would be having a claim to or an assertion about elements of legitimacy, but it would also have basic principles for structuring and understanding how governance is supposed to be carried out in this, in, in that sense. So that's the, that would be the idea of political order. Um, and, and from that, I, I think also uh, the, the idea of, of pathologies and so forth uh, emanate because as, as I was hinting with the EU's development, it it has a set of basic normative principles that this describes to and many of these are actually cosmopolitan however cosmopolitanism has never been it has never been embedded in any kind of governing system and it's it's extremely difficult even if these are kind of universal but there is a universal constitutional uh, set of principles that, that are basically rhyming with the constitutional principles of the of the nations of the mem of the of the state actually the constitutional states that the eu has adopted so it it's, itself has set up these types of principles and therefore shortfalls i mean this will be the simple way of dealing with this shortfalls in these could therefore be called pathological of course all states will then also be imbued with pathologies because no state is fully democratic and constitutional and so forth so this is sort of a kind of a cheap shot in some way at the same time, what, what happens when you have integration and the, the breadth of functional integration as well as the territorial reach also generate expectations and people load expectations on the EU. And I think this is one of the interesting dynamics. And, and that's also part of the way the EU is constitu constituted with the member states participating in the EU institutions. It's extremely difficult to tang untangle what is specifically is EU responsibility and what is member state so this 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 blending is is complicating this and therefore the eu is is loaded with t t different expectations including normative expectations and yet it is not given the capabilities to do so now here my federalist uh, uh, inclination comes out of course um, <laughs> so but I'm ambiguous in terms of whether I think this needs to be embedded in a state. But certainly the idea that, that one should be able to single out a certain 
realm of EU uh, competence and experience is important. But what we have instead is a system where there is a significant discrepancy between the EU, the expectations that are placed on the EU and the resources and capabilities it's actually given to carry these out. So I, this is part of the pathologies and also, also the, the, the problems of developing, as I was saying earlier, the problems of developing um, legitimacy in an experimental union undergoing significant or facing significant challenges. This, this in itself is also generating uh, claims of being pathological, where, which need not necessarily be so. So that's the other thing. There's, a, there's also a, a, a problem of, of generating realistic and, and relevant expectations in this. I, I'm sorry if I complicated this, but uh, um, but there are some there are some conundrums really built into in how this is doing. But and one one needs to be fair to the EU itself also in terms of of um, its its performance and its its, its uh, ability. So I, um, but I, so I pin much on this actually on on the member states not wanting to actually commit to or, or put the money where the mouth is and actually ensure that it, it has the proper resources to carry out what they themselves are making the EU or, or placing as expectations on the EU itself. So it, this comes out then as pathologies, but it need not be EU or, originated. In, in fact, it could its origins could be elsewhere. Could I just add yes, uh, Joseph? one point on, on pathologies, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, segmentation as such uh, is a process that's normal. Uh, it, it, it happens in, in every democratic state. Uh, but in every democratic state, be that Norway, the United States, or you know Germany, or whatever you name it, uh, you do have desegmentation mechanisms. Uh, that is, you know, parliamentary control con uh, committees and so on, who, which can pry open these segments and open up uh, the processes again. But that is not the case in the EU. Uh, the European Parliament or other kinds of parliamentary bodies have only limited, um, you know, desegmented capacity in relation to. Uh, bodies such as the European Stability Mechanism, or in fact, the European uh, External Action Service, right? So that that is a challenge here, uh, where we, uh, I think, do have a democratic challenge with segmentation here, which is about how do we bring about a proper democratic scrutiny and democratic control of these structural mutations that have enabled us actorness, but at the same time are limited in terms of democratic control. Very good. Thank you. Um, Philip. Yeah, thank you, John, Eric, and uh, Josef, for, for a fascinating talk. But I, I'm still struggling to understand what, you know, what, what the punchline is. So here are some conceptual questions. One is, in, is segmented order not a misnomer? You know, in Dokkan, there's this distinction between segmental differentiation and functional differentiation. And in segmental differentiation, the order is constituted by similar units and in functional differentiation by dissimilar units. So it's a, a segmented order is for instance, the international system, it constitutes, uh, it, it consists of states. Some are large, others are small, but they are all states with sovereignty, et cetera, et cetera. And a, a functionally differentiated order is inside the state with the economy, the educational system, the polity, et cetera, separate, but functionally uh, distinct. What you describe about uh, uh, how you describe the EU is as a functionally differentiated system. So there's the community system and that takes care of the market. And there's uh, intergovernmental bodies, they take care uh, of security issues. So that doesn't sound like segmentation, that sounds like functional differentiation. Related question, desegmentation. There are basically two mechanisms of desegmentation. One is the merger of similar units into one larger unit. And the second is uh, the functional differentiation of formerly similar units into dissimilar units. And it's never quite clear what you're referring to if you talk about desegmentation. Third point on segmentation and exploitation. 
you link segmentation to exploitation by saying, you know, they engage in group sync and, you know, they, they have their entrenched um, uh, uh, policy instruments, etc. But then if, if you talk about your cases, it appears that segmentation is actually a technology of exploration. You know, a new challenge comes along. You don't know how to deal with it within your existing system. You, you simply um, um, spin off a new segment that is either able to deal with the crisis and then you keep it or fails at dealing with the crisis and then you can simply let it die without any consequences for um, your overall uh, system. So it's about exploration rather than uh, uh, exploitation. Thank you. Can I start on this? Um, <laughs> very good. Um, well, I, I would take issue with the notion that the state system is segmented. I would say it's differentiated. So, but I mean, what, what your comments are very useful, Philip, because this is one thing we are working on, namely to specify two things. We want to specify exactly what differences there are between segmentation, differences and similarities there are between segmentation and differentiation on one hand, and also in what sense a segmented political system is different from the processes that are going on in state formation and nation building. So that's, that's basically what, what part of our agenda. And as I said, this has not been completed. And in the book, we did not complete this because we didn't try to develop a more general theory of of segmented political orders. Uh, we tried to, in a more inductive way, to try to give a, a, a grasp on the EU itself. Now, the implication is that a segment doesn't cohere with a functional uh, segment, different, with a functional sector, basically. But it has part of that type of logic. Uh, that's, so there is a, there is a certain affinity between the functional specification specialization and the development of segments but it's not it's not organizationally and institutionally compatible with that as such but we normally think of segments as operating within functional spheres however i was ambiguous on this because i am actually not 100 sure if this is how to pin it so if we, for instance, were using the market logic, we would say, look, the segment with that type of logic crosses a number of functional, functionally specific issue areas, okay? Because the market then becomes imperative and imperialistic and then permeates other fields that, that you also see in EU. So this would be one take on it to say that it crosses specific functional spheres. The other one would be the opposite that we have done in the book to say, look, within a certain functional sphere or, sphere or field, there is a specific logic, a specific um, actor orientation, a specific understanding of, of how to deal with, with, um, with economic issues or with um, refugee or border issues that comes in. So that's a specification. So we have not, I mean, at least me, I, I confess I have not pinned down yet where I stand on, on, on this, whether uh, I would pin the idea of segment to a institution, more like an institutional logic, or whether you would pin it more to a specific, clearer ideologic, ideology or actor orientation. Um, that is something that I'm struggling with, but it, but it, it, it will help to go along the lines that you are saying to try to say, okay, what is the specific relationship between this and differentiation? Not differentiated integration, but differentiation. In fact, you could see a certain affinity between elements of differentiated integration and segments in certain ways, as we are seeing in, in the EU, as I talked about these types of functional divide. Um, so well, the easy way out, but to some extent the cop-out will say, look, we are talking about the EU institutionally developed and that these are kind of houses, the community system versus the uh, uh, union system are kind of houses for possibility of segments. But I, I think we need to be more specific on this to develop a, a concept that, it's, that is more uh, fine-tuned to this. And what you said, the, the last point, um, this is something that we have been discussing and I, 
I'm gonna I'm gonna steal this from yourself now. This uh, this uh, um, point you men mentioned about exploitation and exploration. Um, we think that the, the at the actor logic, you have the understanding of exploitation because of the fact that you have reinforcing networks and and so on. But precisely, the, when you go to the system when you have functional needs and so forth, then a segment because it consists in of like-minded people and, and um, solution-oriented people, they will come up with new institutional solutions. And therefore you have also a scope for exploration. So segments can therefore facilitate short-term reforms. Our concern is that in the long run, this can be become, uh, that this can be problematic because you can end up in competency traps, namely learner lock-ins, so that you have the ability to continue learning in a certain pattern. And that reinforces your ability and, and so forth, but it also moves you away from a changing environment, hence gen generating what would, from an outside perspective, be called a pathology pathological development so so the combi so the, the point about this idea of segment is that it combines in a distinctive way exploration and exploitation this is this is how we have gotten now this is after the book we didn't actually manage to do this in the book but we'll but we this dis discuss this and we thought that this could be so you really need to think about combinations of these types of logics to, to capture this Great. I mean, Jon Eric already uh, has said everything, so I don't have to say much more. But I, I'll, I'll touch on two uh, briefly, two issues, which is uh, thank you uh, very much, Philip, for these questions because they're pushing us to be more clear in our definitions and in our in our conceptual thinking. So when you mentioned this about segment segmented order uh, as an alternative to the state and this is something exactly what we've been we've been thinking about which is it has different features and different characteristics structurally and in terms of actorness than a state and and that's what we're trying to define because of course the state system as you know john ruggie would have it is is homonymous it is structurally the same types of units uh, and what we argue is that with segmented orders as the european union we may be moving into a phase of a new heteronomy right uh, so where you would have structurally different types of units coexisting within the same system of, for instance, diplomatic rules. So in terms of external relations, it is obvious that the European Union relates to the outside world differently than a sovereign state. Right? So it has structural features and functions and the way it operates in relation to the outside world, to the external environment, is different than a state. And in fact, it makes it's, it's make, it makes it this difference, it makes it into its modus operandi. If you look at the West, you know, if you look at the Vienna Convention from 1961, it for instance, on diplomatic relations, it for instance, doesn't allow uh, governments to, or states to get involved in the internal affairs of other states. Um, now the EU has been operating exactly like this by the involvement in the internal affairs. Of, uh, of other states. And so the connections, external connections of the EU as a segmented order are actually very often happening via the segments uh, and via these segmented organizations. And it doesn't operate the same way as, uh, as a state. And then the second point, and John Eric already pointed it out indeed, uh, and it's a, very, it's a very good point about different levels. So on the actor level in a segment, in relation to exploitation and exploration on the actor level, you would have a lot of exploitation. Uh, of, um, of cognitive um, frameworks, but on the level of the system as such, on the structural level, you would certainly have a lot of exploration, exactly as you pointed out in relation to the cases we were mentioning, which is uh, new types of organizations emerging to address functional needs under constraints. Yeah. Maybe a quick rejoinder. Um, very quick, John Eric. Yeah, I just also wanted to emphasize that we have basically talked about the EU level, but we also need to take in the member state level much more and also the diversity of member states. And that actually maybe this, these types of logics are possible precisely in systems that are so diverse because you know all federal states are based on symmetry in institutional terms between the central level and the subunit level and the EU doesn't. It has a much higher level of diversity across in terms of constitutional arrangements, institutional arrangements and so forth, societies and all expectations and all this. And it might be these types of, of elements that are more sort of flexible in this that help to keep this, this system together in the first place.
uh, we also have had uh, a debate with uh, with uh, with uh, with uh, Jonathan Seitlin also on experimentalism in this. Uh, so <laughs> some some of <laughs> some of these elements might also be be touched upon in in this. In any case, the idea of relating to the type of diversity and and the fact that the EU sinks into member states that are so diverse also shows that it complicates our thinking about this in, in purely differential terms, in terms of functional differentiation, because you don't have necessarily nation state analogies or member state analogies to what you find in the EU level. And there is no one script also at the member state level that corresponds fully across. I mean, there is this type of variation across these that complicates the whole idea of thinking of this in straightforward functional terms in that sense, because you, of the type of variation. So I think that's another element that adds into the need for a concept that is helping to capture some of this type of, of, of uh, ambiguity and flexibility. Thank you. Um, Bridget? So firstly, can I apologize? I, I didn't hear the presentation. I just came in at the point when you were discussing the ESM because we, we had a differentiated integration individu meeting this morning that went on. So uh, we were talking about the deliverables in another, in another sense. So just to make three very quick points. So John Eric, you, you effectively argued that that uh, the, the concepts you're using can be apply, uh, applied to political systems writ large. But I think the nation state is looming very strongly in your conceptual framing of, of the segmentation. Because when you talk about partial, incomplete, and uh, Joseph, when you mentioned about desegmentation, your analogy was immediately with the democratic state. So I think the benchmark that is there, either implicitly or explicitly, is the nation state, that integration of territory, identity, function. So what, firstly, what would a complete order look like? What would a non-partial order look like in this experimental political order? If because I do think the nation state is looming uh, very large. Secondly, if you look at the development of nation states, then there was the pressure for capacity building, the functional, the response to societal, uh, to societal problems. And then there was the political community dem democratization element. But it really was to try to bring the convergence of territory and identity and function. So these, these have split out in the, in the EU in different ways, as you, you call it segmentation. But I don't think that you are integrating into that the fact that the EU is a, both a union of states and peoples, and it's the member state dimension. These are still nation states that the EU has to work with, because if you could argue that a more democratic EU would require a federalization, parliamentarization of the system at EU level, but that can actually be something that the, that the member states can't bear. It won't go with the nation states, with the with the direction of travel and political capacity of the nation states. So you, you talk about EU level as if somehow or other the member states were not intrinsically embedded in the EU level as they are. Uh, and then I, uh, I had a third point, but my unfortunately my notes are looking far too segmented and disaggregated. So I leave my, I leave my third point for another time. Okay, thank you, Bridget. Um, if you could be brief, uh, mm -hmm. no, yep. uh, well, take, take your time, take your time, but uh, bear in mind there are at least another two questions. Well, I, we did touch on some of this, Bridget, before you, you came in. Um, and I think the nation state analogy is, has two, um, two elements. One is the isomorphic pressure that you get on the EU uh, normatively as well as uh, uh, functionally from the, the presence of the world being composed of states and the fact that the EU still consists, as you said, of nation states or member states. 
So that's, an, that, that's a kind of isomorphic pressure on the EU itself. And the EU is using some of the vocabulary from the nation states, but it is different, as you say. And we want to develop this vocabulary in order to make clear that it is different from a nation state. So, but it is, we are using this, the, the nation state as, a, as an implicit template, just to also to point out that the EU is different. Its way of coming together is dramatically different from the manner in which nation states came together. If you think of the standard, and Daniela is very familiar with this, of course, the penetration, standardization, and so forth of nation building are processes that have not unfolded in Europe. And, um, and therefore are not, I mean, so, so the, the resulting entity is quite different from what we see. So actually this, this is our uh, view, but we cannot escape this, uh, the, the nation state parameter somehow in order to depict it. But this is because we are involved in what Tilly would call an individualizing comparison. We are looking at what are distinctive features of the EU in re relation to the nation state, not claiming that the EU should be or become a nation state. Um, and, and um, if the, the idea of the EU developing, it would, it, there would be claims to territorial functional contiguity in the EU that you see from the nation state. And of course, this is precisely what the EU doesn't have. Um, so I think at least we are, not, we are not in any sense claiming that the EU is moving towards a nation state, rather we're trying to capture the distinctive features of the EU. However, saying that we can analyze the dynamics here in relation in the dynamics of segmentation and desegmentation as, uh, as one of the further dynamics. I'll, um, I'll just add to this. I, I think this is, a, this is a good question. I mean, to clarify as to what exactly is, is the segmented order. And I think what is really interesting about uh, some of the features of the segmented order, which is, you know, the European External Action Service, the European Stability Mechanisms as these interstitial organizations, they are in fact in conflict with the state form, right? Because I mean, it is exactly, the, you know, the, the legitimacy of the European External Action Service is not exactly challenged mostly by external powers. The United States, Russia, you know, Japan, they don't worry too much about who they deal with in Europe as long as it's efficient. What the, the worry is in, on the side of the member states governments who worry about their status as actors in international affairs. If they somehow give up their status as diplomatic actors and, you know, and the, let the EAS perform the job, they're basically losing a key marker of their statehood. And that is the biggest challenge here. So, and the same goes for you know, European stability mechanism. You know, that is also challenged by the member states rather than the outside, right? So if you look at, you know, it's either challenged by the states who are, uh, you know, being offered the bailout packages. Uh, and, you know, there is this famous discourse by, you know, guys like Yanis Varoufakis, who talk about certain types of solutions being promoted by the ESM and not others. And he even talks about something called the European Union's deep state, right? And uh, which cannot be challenged. I don't share that view, but I mean, there is this discourse. So there's this challenge by the states who are actually in the bailout programs. But also you do have the challenge by the member states who are not part of the Euro Eurozone. So you have Sweden, you have Denmark, you have Poland, you have Hungary, who say, well, there, is, there are decisions without our involvement by the ESM and they have a bearing upon our economies and, and, our, and our, uh, our, our resources. So I think, uh, I think in this sense, you do have, you know, the, the, seg the EU as a segmented order is different than the member states themselves. I think there is in fact a conflict between the state system in Europe and the emerging segmented order in the EU. Thank you. I have uh, Martin. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, very interesting discussion. Um, I have um, a question about um, plausible counterfactual in relation to the impact of the crisis um, in the uh, transformation from defragmentation to segmentation. I share some of Philip's uh, concerns about conceptually clarifying desegmentation from segmentation, but um, in your talk, actually, you did not say too much about um, the causal impact of the crisis on this process. And I'm interested in how you, in the book, in the various chapters, um, disentangle this causal impact. In other words, what would have happened if the crisis would not have been there? And you mentioned various crises. The one I know best is the, the migration refugee crisis. And, and, and Frontex. Um, so the transformation from Frontex to the uh, uh, border guard agency, I don't find that a very strong example of um, 
um, a functional um, uh, change. So can you really make the argument that um, with the transformation from Frontex to the border um, guard agency that um, we are now talking about a completely different phenomenon? Um, it seems to me that this functional differentiation, which we saw in the past, so the market logic combined with the um, security logic about external borders that has always been there in Schengen, in the migration cooperation. And we still see that in the way that this functions today. So can we really see a causal impact um, on this um, segmentation process that you, um, that you talk about? Thanks. You want to respond to that, John Eric? Okay. Yeah, Thank you. Go ahead. Martin. I think that's a, that's a good question, and uh, and of course uh, one can see an evolution uh, from Frontex to the EBCG to the European Border and Coast Guard Agency. I think there are a number of changes uh, compared to the way Frontex operated before, and I'm sure you know it better than uh, than, than we do. Uh, we've been studying it, but in terms of the legal status, the EBCG, there are provisions in the legal status and the mandate of the EBCG, which for instance suggests that if a member state of the European Union is incapable of protecting the Schengen borders, then the EBCG can provide um, resources from other member states of, um, of, the, of the Union uh, to do so, to perform it in the territory of that member state, even if the government of the member state would be against that. So this is in fact a challenging situation in terms of the in terms of this you know sovereignty notion. Uh, there is another thing about the EBCG which makes it different from Frontex, which is about the operational domains. So where does it really operate? The Frontex agency has been very much focusing on the borders themselves. The EBCG has a broader mandate. It is about operating in basically in the third country's territories as well as well as inside the European Union, because it has a pool of what they call return specialists. So officials or officers who would be in charge of, uh, you know, bringing migrants or whoever was refused asylum in the EU back to their home countries. So this is much more of a broader horizon of what they actually do. Um, and in this sense, it's a kind of a, it's a different animal uh, legally and, and in terms of mandate. So that's why, uh, that's why we arguably would see this as, a, as an example of an evolution of an institutional evolution towards something different than, than Frontex. Yeah. I'd, I'd also like just to add more on a, on a conceptual level that I think that um, we need concepts that, that enable us to go beyond the, for instance, the supranational intergovernmental divide and debate we have in the EU. And of course, as we said, the, our notion of segmented order actually is able to encompass both types of logics. It's perfectly okay to think about a segmented order that has both types of logics built in, in complex combinations, as we do see in the EU. That, so in that sense, we're also trying to bridge that type of debate between these two types of, of elements, because we know that the EU is neither fully supranational, nor is it actually intergovernmental. It is, if anything, transgovernmental in those areas that, because there is also integration in, in the intergovernmental realm. So, so the fact that these terms themselves have become mutated in, in the EU const constellation means that there is a need for a concept that can capture these types of, of elements in, in itself. And I think that, that this, should help us to to move along these lines. The other thing is that I think we should also be aware of of um, the talking too much about structure and not bringing in actors. Uh, also, uh, and with that I mean mind frames, ideologies, perspectives, and so forth, actor oriented aspects. Uh, so that the actor structure dimension needs to be brought into the way in which we are discussing about political systems. And again, the idea of segment brings that in. What sh we should have amplified in, in our presentation was, of course, that when you move from the mesa to the macro, there is an important uh, difference in the sense that the shift itself is also about the solidifying because we he touched also on constitutive principles and so forth. And therefore there's a solidification of certain types of act orientation. So that if you look at, at elements of, um, of actors that are solidified in systems, then it becomes a logic that is in, built into it. It's not something that one necessarily reads out from the specifics of the actors themselves, but it's rather a feature or an orientation that you can read from the system itself.
so there is so there is of course uh, ossification and and so on when you move to the macro level in a sense as things are being embedded so therefore the structural element matters more when you move from meso to macro so the the orientation and the uh, inclinations of the actors matters more when you are at the meso level in terms of more network structures and and the structural elements, institutionalized features and so forth matter more at the macro level. So there's a shift in that sense that needs to be, be captured. But it, again, just to reiterate that we need to include aspects of actors as well as structures in the conceptualization. So that's these are two of the uh, justifications we find for um, bringing in this idea of, of segmented political order as, as a way of, of trying to frame the debate. And again, we are not confining this to the European Union. There's absolutely no reason for doing so. Uh, but it, but it, and it, it goes back to some of, of, of Bridges' comments, namely that we should be aware of not being stuck in the um, nationalist trap, in a sense, by because so many states are not functioning as sovereign states. It, it's the reified normative picture of, of how states ought to be functioning that is actually guiding analysts. And you often get very lopsided analysis of or comparisons between the EU and nation states, because people use say, a, a reification of the nation state as a kind of sovereign entity, like the Brexit debate is, is, is wonderful in that sense, um, compared to the EU, of course, which is a complex system and nobody really has agreed on what is. Now that is a deeply lopsided and normatively laden type of, of comparison in itself, because it reifies certain normative principles that we associate with the nation state without necessarily seeing many of these in many states. You look at states around the world, they are not sovereign in the military sense. I mean, this is a key element of penetration in, in a nation building scheme. So, so that's also why we, we, we need a vocabulary that is also more realistic, that is actually capturing um, what is going on in on the ground and not being completely hijacked by a normative uh, framework that has outgrown its role in today's world. So we know that the, the states are still there, of course, as hierarchical entities, but the idea of them being sovereign nation states has never been, it's a fiction. It's always been a normative precept. Okay, maybe just... Um, um... It's past two o'clock, but I wanted to uh, also uh, link up with what you just uh, just said. Uh, to some extent, you answer uh, uh, Bridget's um, uh, questions, and the mind goes in the same uh, direction to some to some ex extent. Um, you mentioned Tilly and others that have uh, worked in a historical uh, perspective on the trajectory of the of the state. Uh, I wonder if you um, take everything out of this uh, temporal comparison that you could, uh, um, and uh, because my sense is that you dismiss a bit the concept of state too quickly. And uh, my impression was also that you confine the comparison with the one type of state, the nation state, the Westphalian state that had a very short lived uh, existence. Uh, compared to other, uh, other types of, uh, of, of states. Um, so I don't know, you say the EU is not a state and depends, I, 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 I would say. I mean, to me, uh, to me, it looks very much like a state. If I think of other states that to me look quite similar, uh, think of the Habsburg empire. Uh, I don't know, to me, this was a state. Uh, but not a nation state and certainly not the features that, um, if I think about the Swiss Confederation, um, but these are static comparisons and you can say, okay, yes, but you would historically have um, examples where you have this kind of messy uh, uh, constellation of different, uh, yes, uh, segments and, um, However you want to, however you want to call them, but also dynamically, uh, I don't know. Even if you confine it to the nation state, let's say the nation, like Bridges said, the nation state looms large in your conceptualization because you always have it there. Uh, even if you confine it to that, nation states went through extremely complex uh, processes of unification, integration. Uh, penetration into into their uh, 
own peripheries, uh, centralization, and, 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 and so on. And it seems to me that you could make much more out of these uh, comparisons and um, then see European integration as one further step in this trajectory of state development. Very good. Um, I, 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 I agree with you on this because if you, if you look at a historical perspective, what was called a state has varied dramatically over time uh, from uh, Italian city-states to, to the current. I think, I guess my main concern was the, the doctrine of nation-state sovereignty, which to me sovereignty is a normative precept that prescribes that that this should that a system should have territorial control over all functional realms that it is in 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 that is that are relevant to it. Okay, so so the, this idea of complete territorial control across all functional domains that's the the, the, the precept that I have had a problem with, and I said this is the this is a normative concept. If you start look going to history we'll see that all of these have been flexibilized as you were saying daniela this is precisely the point um, but we also see then that going back and flexibilizing is means that the degree of territorial control across different functions varied dramatically in these areas yes they were called states but they deviate from the idea of sovereign nation state that has become the kind of normative fiction that we see in in today's world so that's exactly our point to go back also to the earlier pre-modern nation state period and say, look, there are parallels. Because if you also if you use Rockan, his idea of of the of the imprint of the Roman Empire on Europe with Roman law, with Latin language, and with the Catholic Church, these are supranational and they have not vanished. They live together in in, in a system which is normatively labeled na national sovereign states in Europe, however, are operating still in a much more complex tapestry in Europe. And of course, the European Union is unleashing some of these and developing new patterns as well. So, so um, these forms of stateness certainly exist in Europe, but they take on a different shape and form that than the nation state sovereign precepts that we find. So in that sense, there's also this idea of historical continuity, but it varies a lot also because of the development of global hegemons and also the military alliances and so forth that are also undermining and changing the notions of sovereignty in practice, not the doctrine of sovereignty so much as actually the practice. So, so that gives resonance to the thinking about this in, in, in a more complex way. However, what, what I think is also important to underline with, with the EU that has affected me a lot is, is the thinking that the EU is borrowing stateness more than actually being a state itself. And that's why I was drawing on the fusion thesis and also what uh, Philip and, and Marcus have been talking about in terms of core state powers. That I'm, I'm very struck by this, that the EU is, level is not a distinct level that is separate from the member states. It is embedded in the member states through, through the way in which member states are participating in EU institutions. That to me is a very important element of the EU itself. It shows some of the, it facilitates action of course, but it also places significant constraints and, and leads to this type of ambiguity that we see in the EU. So, so yes, the EU piggybacks on the member states and therefore borrows their stateness and some eight times some circumstances exercises this quite effectively in other cases exhibits the limitations and constraints built on it by its member states and that varies we try to say that this varies according to these functional realms so that it is unleashed much more for instance in the community system than it is in the intergovernmental realm so that's just type of one reading or or piggybacking on the literature on this to try to 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 speak spin it in those terms but thank, um, thank you yeah thank you thank you uh, john eric um i so i'm afraid we uh passed the two two o'clock um so the seminar has to come to uh, an end thank you very very much again uh joseph and john eric for a stimulating and very engaging session on your new book it has been a true pleasure to have you and
we're really very, very uh, grateful. Thank you also everyone for attending and for the lively uh, discussion. Apologies for going beyond the 2 p.m. Um, before closing, I also want to uh, thank our team, especially Sarah Bernstein and Lorenzo Cicchi for all the great work they do in organizing this seminar uh, series. Um, uh, be assured that this is very much appreciated. So we reconvene after the holidays on uh, January 13, and hopefully I will see many of you then for another interesting uh, number of sessions. We have a very interesting program in the spring semester uh, as well. And in the meantime, I wish you all and your families very happy holidays and all the best for the new year. Thank you again, John Eric. Thank you again, uh, Joseph and uh, everyone. Have a very good day and uh, see you soon again.